Hello and welcome to One Thing Queer. My name is Jenny Baton and my pronouns are they, them. And I'm Kelsey Wren and my pronouns are she, her. Hello, friend. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited today. I know. I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest. <laughs> don't be <laughs> nervous. We have our very first guest that we don't know it like in like real life. This mm-hmm. is the first time we meet you in yeah. person. So please welcome our friend, Sam. Hey, Kelsey. <laughs> hello. Hello. <laughs> Okay, I was trying to stop it. <laughs> I'm still trying to master the applause button. That's good. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing really good. Yeah? Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so we met on Lex because I did a little post, which for those who don't know, Lex is a queer community app that some people use for dating um community friends pretty much all networking i kind of think of it as like a craigslist for you know queer folks personals yeah that's, yeah i think that's how they used to advertise themselves yeah they were like a personals app yeah yeah so i did one of those and i was like uh anybody want to come on the podcast <laughs> and like tell a story like I, that's why we started this podcast so when i found likes it was like so exciting for me to like have somewhere to like be able to talk to people and you know give that invitation that open invitation for people to come on and share their story so you reached out to me yeah yeah so thank you for coming on and for wanting to share your story you have a very interesting and beautiful story that we're so excited to hear about um so tell us a little bit about yourself yeah um my name is sam i have uh she her pronouns um and like what's really unique about my story is that I'm intersex. Mm-hmm. So in like the LGBTQI, I'm the I. <laughs> yeah. Um, yay. <laughs> yay. Um, my specific condition is called uh, partial androgen insensitivity syndrome, which uh, P-A-I-S for short. Mm-hmm. And um, it's something that I've been aware of um, for almost like my entire life. Um, and my family has like known about it like since I was born, like literally like out of the delivery room they're like hmm something is up yeah um and so it's kind of like cultivated my experiences to be like pretty like focused around like having like this condition um of like going to like doctors and like how i like interact with like people and like basically how like my family prepped me to like become an adult this is how they explained it to me and then i was also doing like research on my own to kind of like validate it but um when somebody is like conceived and like when the fetus is being developed every fetus starts at like the baseline of like every every fetus is like exactly the same Mm -hmm. um and then if you have like a y chromosome um around like six or seven weeks into development like the y chromosome then starts to basically sends like a trigger of like hey like you're now going to like develop like these parts of the body and like the the testes and like the produced testosterone and like all that kind of stuff gotcha um and my specific condition, um, what it means by like partial androgen insensitivity is like the hormones that like your like gonads, like the ovaries, testes like produce, mm-hmm. those are considered like androgens, mm-hmm. like testosterone, and estrogen, just like one part of them. But then there's also like other hormones that they secrete. And um, insensitivity basically just means that like my body straight up does not completely understand it it's gotcha. like if someone okay. gives me like a dollar bill my yeah. body can like only for some reason like translate that into like two cents of currency you oh, know? It's okay like, it's like hmm i don't know what to do with like 98 percent of the rest of it wow and i'm gotcha. just gonna have one okay um and so what that basically means for me is that like i have xy chromosomes mm-hmm. like genetically i'm considered male if someone took my karyotype yeah which i did have done um yeah. funny enough um you would consider me like biologically male but because of my condition the partial androgen sensitivity my body was like i don't know what to do with like these hormones and like i i don't know what to do and so my body just didn't like really develop in like the very like kind of like traditional ways that like people expect okay um and how this was caught is basically when i was born Mm -hmm. um 
the way that my mom described it is that when I was born in like a snowy day, like in a blizzard in like South Dakota, um, the doctors took me away from like both of my parents and they didn't tell them why. No oh, way. Exactly. Oh my God. Ouch. <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> That's so crazy. Ooh. And um, she just, she w- used to describe it as like a mild kind of like panic in the emergency room. Yeah. Like they brought like another doctor in and oh. then like no one was like really communicating with them. Oh my God. Um, wow. And like my parents are Russian immigrants. Like they, they came from Russia. Um, both of them like didn't speak like very much English at the time. And so like I can totally understand like how kind of scary and like confusing it might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm the third child, so like my mom has had like some experience with okay. other kids. Okay, um, I was gonna ask. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like is this is our first t- time having a kid. Yeah, that, ooh, I would be so scared if yeah. that was like my first time and like someone just yeah. Um, but yeah, so the doctors like took me away, um, and they just apparently they were struggling to determine my sex at birth, and um. The reason they were struggling is because, like, if you have, like, something, like, ambiguous genitalia, as Mm -hmm. they kind of, like, refer to it, Mm -hmm. um, they don't know what bucket to place you in. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting and that, like, I found is that, like, if they don't know what bucket to place you in, the doctor can just decide. That is insane. They can just be like, you know, like, I'm just going to decide this one's a male. Wow. Um, And they don't have to consult their parent or they just... It's been changing, like, a lot over, like, the many many years Mm -hmm. um i was born in like the the late 90s and in like the late 90s like i I have found like some documentation um like we're in like like late late 90s like 97 98 Mm -hmm. where like they have kind of like game plans um for like doctors of like hey like if a child is born with like ambiguous genitalia like this is how you're supposed to like treat them and like one of those steps is to consult with the parents okay um but you know, I grew up in South Dakota. Um, it's very like red, and <laughs> yeah. it's also like um, my parents were immigrants, and like they just it, who knows? Like there could have been like just like a lot of different um, yeah like reasons as to like maybe like communication like was attempted, but like it fell through because of like language barriers. Gotcha. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the doctors for me, they decided you're going to be a girl. And so they they put my gender marker as like female. Um, that's like my sex on my birth certificate. Mm-hmm. And they were just like, congrats, you're you gave birth to like a little girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, like that was like super interesting. Um, and my parents, um, both of them, they just kind of like they went with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think like the doctors like clearly explained to them that like because they didn't know like the specifics of of my condition they just knew like they couldn't really determine like my sex at birth Mm -hmm. um and it wasn't until i hit like maybe like six or seven years old that like my parents um my mom specifically she read like a news article in like our local newspaper about like this doctor in like ann arbor michigan that was like treating people with um they used to call it like disorders of sexual development, DSD. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like another umbrella term similar to like intersex. Yeah. Um, recently, like maybe in like the last uh, like five years though, um, there's been like a change of where like they don't like the word disorder. Yeah. And so they changed it to differences. Um, so if you hear me refer to both, like it's the same. It's okay. the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but that that like article that she found was basically talking about like a doctor who was like oh yeah like you know not all kids are like born the same Mm -hmm. into like either bucket and um like i'm really like proud of my mom for like i don't know like really fighting for me in like the sense that like she like she really went out of her way to like find me like the best like medical care that she could within like the confines of the systems that we had Mm -hmm. i grew up like pretty poor we were like on medicaid and so like I just remember, like, somehow, like, still being able to, like, get treatment and, like, going to, like, doctors and so on and so forth. So, like, really mad impressed with, like, my, like, yeah. immigrant mom. Like, very Shout out to her. Yeah. Shout out to her. <laughs> shout out to mom. I love that. Yeah. I love that so much. Um, so, you grew up. Tell us a little bit about uh, how it was growing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I grew up in South Dakota. I grew up in the largest city in oh. South Dakota. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> the la of south dakota (laughs) yeah the la um what's really funny about that is the largest city is sioux falls Mm -hmm. it's like a hundred and fifty thousand people wow wow (laughs) 
that's that's i mean that's that's pretty big for like a small city i feel awful that the reason i know that is because one of the teen moms is from that area and that's how i know <laughs> i love that yeah i'm like oh that sounds really familiar oh trash tv never mind trash tv yeah. <laughs> that's so cool um that's like the size of pasadena yeah yeah wow if like if you like hide everything else around pasadena yeah it's, it's pasadena oh wow that's crazy yeah yeah super interesting um it didn't feel like a small town though like um you know like we had a variety of like things to do like there's like go-karts and like um like laser tag arenas like there was like things that i would attribute to kind of like a big city you yeah know? um because like I had friends that lived on like the outskirts of that town mm-hmm. in like the smaller towns where there's like nothing. Yeah. 50 people. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. Could you imagine? Uh, no, I please don't make me imagine. <laughs> Your grocery store was like the gas station convenience store. That's oh, wow. crazy. That's oh wild. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, it's, you know, a very kind of like landlocked like in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. uh it's also considered pretty deeply like the great plains so like super flat oh wow um absolutely like no mountains like the hiking there atrocious (laughs) (laughs) no uphills beginner level (laughs) everywhere (laughs) yeah yeah it's just a walk (laughs) yeah um and because like it's so flat it's Mm -hmm. also so windy all the time oh Um, yeah god and i hate the wind yeah oh man yeah so bad me too how long were you there till um, I like left, I think like when I was like 19. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and we're straight to LA. Wow. Wow. So you've been here since then? I've been here since oh then. Oh my wow. God. Wow. Yeah. yeah. How old are you? If you don't mind me asking. 26. 26. Okay. Oh, okay. Took me a little bit. Okay. 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 <laughs> You're my brother's age. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Okay. So you came to LA terrifying by yourself, right? Was it terrifying? Was it by yourself? Kind of. Was it terrifying? <laughs> yeah yeah i'm like perpetually scared like i am i i'd like to think that like i'm terrified with just like everything but like i like force myself to like be brave to like do it um yeah so like it was definitely like nerve-wracking um i had like no real safety net aside from like one friend that i moved here with and the circumstances of, like me coming to la is like really just because of this one friend so like long story short i grew up with this um kid we went to like high school together um but we only knew each other for like the last like two years of high school at like junior senior year and um we got like pretty close and then when he left for college i took a gap year and he went to usc okay um and i had like been talking like in vague terms to like anyone who would listen i was like i want to live in california (laughs) no specific city literally just the state california Mm -hmm. (laughs) so big like there's so many options Mm -hmm. um and in his like junior year of college um i had just started college in like south dakota he you know he would come back like every summer and like we'd hang out and he'd like talk to me and he's like i don't want to live in like the college dorms anymore with roommates he's like i want to move out into like an apartment like next to campus and he's like sam do you want to come out to LA and like, be my roommate? And I was like, yes. <laughs> um, so in like a span of um, a couple of months, like I think like literally like three months, I um, I wrapped up like my college school year back in South Dakota. Um, I sold like a lot of like my big possessions, like my car. And then like we like crammed everything into like his car, like this like little sedan. Oh and then we like, we moseyed our way on over. <laughs> um all the way from like Sioux Falls, South Dakota to wow. Los Angeles. Wow. Well, and then I just kind of stayed here. What was your first uh, impression of Los Angeles coming from there? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that like, oof. Um, just like very overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, like nothing prepares you for like the crazy traffic oh, God. of like, I remember seeing like the first dang i don't even know how many like lanes we're at now like six lanes across or whatever mm-hmm. and i just remember we were being like shell-shocked almost it was yeah. just like this is how people drive and the amount of people <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and, and he was like chill with it he's just like cruising and i'm just like oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was um definitely like pretty spooky uh just like the overwhelming amount of like people everywhere mm-hmm. like that was like the biggest shell shock it's just like in like south dakota like in, in my small town like 
yeah, like the grocery stores were packed. Like you'd sometimes think like, people walking down the street. Here though, like it's everything was like <laughs> ten times as much. Yeah, so. absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to when you were saying when you grew up in South Dakota, you had mentioned to us that you were homeschooled. Mm. Oh, yes. When you were a child. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about your experience being homeschooled? Yeah. Um, Okay. So my parents are Russian and I like to consider them tiger parents. Okay. Um, (laughs) What does that mean? (laughs) Okay. I haven't heard that term. No. (laughs) Um, So tiger parents is something that like is used in like the Asian community to describe parents who are like very... um, have like very high lofty expectations for their oh, children okay gotcha. um and so they're the kind of parents that are like they're like cracking the whip a little bit they're like you need to like study five hours a night and like you need to like take really advanced courses and like you're going to be a doctor you're going to be a lawyer an engineer nothing else oh okay yeah and um my my mom's like specifically from like this part of russia um she used to just describe it as like Siberia, but mm-hmm. it's like Eastern Russia, and it's like more closer to like Mongolian roots, and so like a, a bit more of like an Asian influence. Um, anyways, so when I was born, um, I already had like two older brothers, mm-hmm. um, and they were like maybe two, three years older than me, um, and the first one they immediately sent off to like kindergarten, like first grade, all that stuff. The second brother, um, they sent to like first grade and they like homeschooled him for like just a ton. And then for some reason for me, they just decided to homeschool me until I was like six years old. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I remember like sitting at like this like little kid size table with like my mom and like she'd have like the Russian alphabet. And so she'd be like teaching me like Russian um, how to like write and like cursive and then like math. I remember doing like addition and like subtraction tables and things like that um and so a lot of my experiences was like one-on-one kind of like with my mom specifically because my father was off working and Mm -hmm. like my brothers were probably in school or were busy um and I would just be yeah like working like alone with like my mom just like learning all these things and so like I like to tell people that like I grew up as Russian first Mm -hmm. even though I lived in you know the the states Yeah. yeah um because like my my only experience with like american culture before i like went to school was like church basically oh okay my parents like both went to church and like the family would go and like there was like the community of like churchgoers that like we would like interact with but i was like this like little six-year-old kid that like spoke mostly russian (laughs) um and there's no there's no real russian community in sioux falls um gotcha Mm -hmm. and so we didn't really have anyone outside of like the immediate family Mm -hmm. um And yeah, so like, I was like this little Russian kid. Um, And then when I turned six, um, my mom took me to a school and they're like, okay, let's get you into like a placement test. And so I took a placement test. And um, when you're six, you're supposed to like be in about like first grade. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess like she taught me so well that like I was able to like pass with like flying colors that they're like, you know, you want to be like more challenged. And so tiger parent my mom was like yes, yes. yes. more challenge <laughs> indeed so, i did my job <laughs> <laughs> exactly so um they sent me off to second grade um oh, wow and so i was like throughout my entire like career of like being like a student um i was like the runt of the litter you know i was always a year younger than all of my peers um and yeah there was always like the high expectations from my parents to like keep pursuing like very like challenging academia and so like as i as i got older and like went through the school system um there's like this pressure to like take the accelerated courses to take like advanced placement mm-hmm. courses and like all sorts of kind of stuff like that wow well, that's a lot <laughs> i'm like the pressure <laughs> i know i i mean my parents i guess they were a little bit like that but not to that extent i think it wasn't as bad i'm mexican so mm-hmm. like it's kind of similar coming from immigrant parents i think mm-hmm. it's just kind of a a thing that happens yeah. like you know they're like we can we came here for you mm-hmm. exactly yeah they have like all of their expectations are on you they're yes like, we came here to give you a better life mm-hmm. not us a better life mm-hmm. yes when i was growing up um my mom gave me a, a pretty not like a kind of like a russian like traditional like a uh, girl's name like, okay it was three syllables, which for me is two syllables too long. <laughs> I mean, same. My name's Jennifer, so. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, that's a lot, though. I, mine's only two syllables, but I, I'm like, can you just call me Kels? It's easy. <laughs> yeah. like, it's, I don't like the E part. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, like, 
I really didn't like having such a long name. Yeah. Um, and there's like the variations, like the the ways to shorten it. I didn't like it either. I was mm-hmm. just like, there's like a couple different ways. I was like, both are icky. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> um, and my mom would always just be like, oh, like I chose this name specifically for you because I used to want to be called this. I was like, okay. <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> um, but when I was um, in high school, uh, this was after I, I had learned that I was like intersex and like the specifics of my condition and I had started um, like hormone replacement therapy and all that stuff. I um, I had one friend that I like shared with like my condition. Um, um, it was this friend that I made playing video games online and we just were like super close. We would like FaceTime and like we would just like have like these really like long Skype calls and everything like that. And um, I remember one day like going to him and just being like, you know, I don't feel like this name. And I was like, I kind of want to, you know, go by something different. He's like, oh, OK, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I was like, will you help me like brainstorm a name? And he's like, I got you. <laughs> um, and so I had like two specific requirements. Like one, it had to be short. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't want any like three syllable long name. I was like, I want it to be short. Yeah. Um, and then the second one was like, it was important for me to have it be gender neutral. Mm-hmm. Um, almost as like kind of like a out of respect for like being born intersex. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, like I can't really control a whole lot, but like, I, I can control like what people call me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so like we went through like a bunch of names like Alex. I was like, hmm, no, I don't feel like Alex. <laughs> like Morgan, um, Taylor, like just like a lot of like um, very like American kind of like names. Yeah. Um, and I settled on Sam because there's a lot of like literary characters that I like with the name Sam, mm-hmm. uh, like Sam Winchester from mm-hmm. like Supernatural. <laughs> Um, my brother is obsessed with that show. You sorry. already do. Yes. <laughs> um, I was like, this sounds really cool. Um, <laughs> but then there's also like, um, from like Perks of Being a Wallflower, mm-hmm. like uh, Emma Watson plays the character Sam. Mm-hmm. And she's like this really cool, like, I don't know, like female, like friends to like Charlie. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I chose Sam and I just kind of like stuck with it. And like at first there's definitely kind of like, like a a disassociation like there's like this weird middle period of like i was like shedding my old name and then like this new name of sam i was like it feels weird um and like you know it's like not exactly mine and i didn't like it wasn't like a legal name change like it was just in school yeah um and it i basically started off like really small of like just like my like super tight-knit like close circle of like friends of where i was like hey like i want you to call me sam now it's like i don't want you to you know use my previous name Mm -hmm. um and I think it's actually kind of like with pronouns of like some people reject that. Yeah. Um, For me, it's funny because being non-binary, my name is v- very feminine. Like my name is Jennifer. I never liked Jennifer and never went by Jennifer. The only people that called me Jennifer were like teachers, doctors, and my mom when she got really mad. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I for me... I like my name Jenny or Jen like that feels like me and even though I'm non-binary I chose to keep my name because I want to kind of break the the gender you know norms of like even names because sometimes I'm like well you could be non-binary and have a very feminine name or a very masculine name whatever it may be yeah it doesn't really matter Mm -hmm. to me but it just goes to show that it's different for everybody Mm -hmm. yeah and that's valid Mm -hmm. you know yeah Mm -hmm. I, I think that whole thing with like being like non-binary is also just like, you know, just because you are like non-binary doesn't mean you have to like start conforming to like a certain specific, like you don't yeah. have to look androgynous. Exactly. You, can be, like, <laughs> you don't have to look non-binary. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Um, like you can be like femme presenting or like masculine. It doesn't yeah. matter. Like, yeah. Change it up every day. Whatever you want. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so my experiences with like changing my name, like just with like my friends was like, real like some people were like super gung-ho they're like yes like, mm-hmm. i got you hey sam what's up i was like yes <laughs> right here <laughs> um, my but my siblings straight up rejected mm-hmm. um and i would like you know how like uh some people they're like let me correct you, uh your use of my pronouns with like an air horn that was basically me mm-hmm. i was the air horn oh. anytime someone would like you know use my old name um 
I would like take personal offense at that and it'd be like, no, my name is Sam. I love that. That's great. And I was just I like, I love that too. I was like such an advocate for like my own name. So like with like my oldest brother and everything, um, he, he like took the longest. I was like, no, like you can like respect me and like use the name that I want or you can like not talk to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was also like really weird with like, like my like romantic relationships. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is so cringy. This is high school. <laughs> um, I had this boy in high school that like had a, a, like a crush on me and like, you know, um, throughout like all of like school. And he, when I like told him about like the name change, he was like, um, I didn't fall in love with Sam. I fell in love with this old name. I was like, mm-hmm. what does that even mean? <laughs> I was like, gross. First yeah. Off. Um, and I was like, no. Mm -hmm. i don't care yeah my name is sam if you don't respect that i'm not talking to you i love that good for you it takes a lot it's hard it's hard it's really hard yeah um yeah but that didn't like um still didn't have like a legal name change like my um my parents weren't like any and i actually never like had that conversation with my parents of like Mm -hmm. telling them like the name like my they knew that like i was going by sam because like friends would call me that like in their presence Mm -hmm. um but like we never had like a i don't know like a come together moment where like i sat them down and i was like hey like this is what i want to be called mm-hmm. i just kind of like didn't care like what they called me i guess like at that point yeah um yeah and um when i got my first job i remember like seeing someone with a name tag that like wasn't their name and i was like wait a second we can have name tags that isn't our legal name and I remember asking like my like manager or something. I was like, "Can I have a name tag that says Sam on it?" <laughs> and they're like, "Yeah." I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> so, like when I got like my first like name tag with like the name Sam. That's like basically when I like I like fully committed. I was like, "Okay, like Sam everywhere. Like I'm not using like my my old name anywhere except like on like legal forms." Mm-hmm. Um, and like in South Dakota, I like I did start looking into like the process of like what it takes to like change a name mm-hmm. like, through like the court system and. It was like, I was like poor back then. It was like seventy dollars just to file the forms. I wow. was like, that's a lot of money. Um, yeah. And I was like, I was like dirt poor basically. Um, and so I was like, I don't want to like spend the money on this. Yeah. Fun surprise. When I moved to LA, um, the paperwork here to file is like four hundred something. Oh, oh no! <laughs> wow. Uh, did not know that. Did not know that either. Holy crap! <laughs> so when I moved here at like nineteen, you're was, like crap. <laughs> I was like. I'm going to like look into changing my name now, like new city, like new, new person, like fresh start. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how much is it to file the paperwork? $400. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's just the paperwork. They call, uh, like, there's like, you have to like pay for like passport, social security, driver's license, all sorts of kind oh, of wow. wild mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and I finally like went through like the legal name change of filing the paperwork, doing all that work, um, maybe about like three years ago. I'm going to say like, right before the pandemic Mm -hmm. um i like filed the paperwork and then i updated like my driver's license passport and social security and the only thing i haven't touched because i haven't taken the time to like figure it out is like my birth certificate Mm -hmm. because it's in south dakota and like i'm i don't quite know like am i supposed to go to south dakota and just be like hi i was born in this state yeah like update my certificate that, yeah that sounds complicated yeah. or complex to do mm-hmm. yeah yeah but it's not important to me yeah. um and if anything like i think the birth certificate's kind of interesting because mm-hmm. it's like like that's what i was born as you know like that's what they chose for me right mm-hmm. they, this is your sex this is your name everything else so i was like for me it's almost like a memento and like i i don't Aww. have a desire to teach it yeah t- to change it at this point mm-hmm. um and so i've just kind of left it a fun a fun kind of like thing about like my name um in terms of like with my sister is that um i don't consider it a dead name Mm -hmm. um i know there's like some kind of like allegories with like the trans community of where they're like very like protective yeah um and like if people like you know they mention like the my old name i'm like okay Mm -hmm. um you know i just lose respect for them and like i don't talk to them (laughs) but um my little sister recently like a couple months ago like she found like an old bookmark of mine from like my like middle school days like for geometry class (laughs) and it had my old name on it and she like sends me a picture and i like noticed she had like scribbled out my old name she like wrote sam and i i asked her i was like did you do that Mm -hmm. i was like i don't remember going by sam in like middle school and she's like yeah she's like i didn't know if you would be upset seeing your dead name oh Oh. that's adorable i was like that's so cute that's so sweet that was very sweet yeah i was like oh like 
that's so kind of you yeah like mm-hmm. i like no hard feelings i was like oh nice that's how you know yeah when people write for you yeah. like they're they're down for you yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it was like a really wholesome like kind of like sisterly bond it is that was so cute. me and you are like such like <laughs> such saps we're like oh my god <laughs> it's so sweet it's oh, sweet baby. because it's we both also have experiences like i think with your older your older sibling where like our siblings are not super accepting or like they're not we're not that close so like to see that closeness like you and i both have that with our, with our younger brother because mm-hmm. um, my your younger brother would do that for you I'm sure of it and mine would do it for me if the need be so it's like ugh, it's just like nice nice that you have some kind of bond with that also with a sibling yeah and it's not all tumultuous with every single one of them yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 my my brothers did come around like eventually like it, it took them a while like you know I was enough of an air horn that like I was just like <laughs> good for you yeah it just like got to the point of like I think like they got so like displeased with like interacting with me yeah um when like you know they didn't follow my rules that like eventually like they're just like yeah, yeah. they submit it good so. I love that <laughs> persistence perseverance make them submit yes <laughs> <laughs> my way or the highway yeah <laughs> i love that so coming to la did you notice um let's talk a little bit about like the queer community um and like what was like your experience coming to la and like experiencing like more of like people being out you know here as to you know um growing up in south dakota like not probably not seeing as many people because it was so such a red state mm-hmm. um yeah, like, so in terms of, like, the queer community, um, what's really interesting is that, like, I had no experience with the queer community, mm-hmm. like, before coming to L.A. Yeah. In the sense that, like, um, I think, like, some some guides out there for, like, if, if your child is intersex, like, how do you help them? I think, like, one of the common things now is, like, you know, try to find them something to do with, like, the LGBTQIA community, like, maybe taking them to Pride, something to, like, you know, help bring them into, like, a environment that's like more accepting Mm -hmm. um and i think it's partially because my parents um like were russian so they have like very stereotypical russian like kind of like gender roles and gender roles but also like russia's like pretty i don't know like homophobic yeah Yeah. it's not safe to be like out there (laughs) yeah um and so i had no exposure to like queer community at all um and like even though i was clearly intersex and like my parents knew and like i i believe at that point it was like part of like the alphabet or Mm -hmm. you know like Uh, alphabet mafia yeah alphabet mafia (laughs) um no no exposure to it um so when i when i first like moved to la like um i like kind of carried like that like shell shock of like not being exposed and so like for like my first couple of years like i i didn't really do anything like with pride Mm -hmm. um and i had like a girlfriend in high school like you know um and yeah it was just like really interesting of like I never had like a coming out moment. Mm-hmm. Um, like when I started dating a girl, I was just like, she's cute. I like her. <laughs> um, that's it. Yeah. Like I didn't like, I felt like, I don't know, for some reason, like the, like the feeling of like being intersex and like everything that I had like lived up to like that point of like the doctors and like the, the weird kind of like experiences with like the name and everything. Um, it felt like such small fish for me to like be like, I think I like girls. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I also like, I wasn't like looking for like my parents, like kind of like acceptance yeah. in terms of like sexuality or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, it wasn't until like, yeah, like a couple years ago um, that like, honestly, I think Lex was like one of like the big things that like really helped me like mm-hmm. find and like identify like the queer community in like LA mm-hmm. um, because like, it's also like Instagram with like their how they like suggest things for you. Mm-hmm. Once you start following like one queer thing, you start to get suggested like a bunch of others. Oh yeah. Um and like it it started from like one small sip from like the stream and then like a full blown waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Oh, we saw you followed like <laughs> hot Donna's or like this for <laughs> queer org. And then all of a sudden it's like, here's like twelve others mm-hmm. in Los Angeles and like here's everything that they're doing. Yeah. Um, so it was like it was like a waterfall for sure. I love that. Um I will also mention that like I don't have like an intersex community. Not mm-hmm. really. Um I I've never met anyone else with like my same condition. Um and like there's other like kind of common conditions that like um i i've also not really like met people that 
really identify as intersex or like have like intersex traits um and so most of like my like connections with like the queer community like so far have been purely almost just like with like the sexuality like mm-hmm. aspect of it like you know yeah gay straight yeah not straight yeah <laughs> <laughs> All stuff. do you think it's because like the reason i was so excited for you to come on is because i feel like it's a topic that doesn't really get talked about and there isn't as much exposure as i think there should be because i think i mean mm-hmm. there's intersex people all over the world and like nobody talks about it and do you think it's primarily because of that i think partially um i also think that like the reason nobody talks about it is because like some people don't even know that they're intersex yeah Mm -hmm. um and the only reason that like i know i'm intersex is because of like the weird like circumstances of my birth and the fact that like my particular condition like immediately kind of like sends like a a signal that like hey this body's not developing like in either like the two normal buckets Mm -hmm. yeah um but there are conditions that are like different than mine that like fall into like the intersex umbrella Mm -hmm. that like you can't tell unless you do like actual like blood work and like you know hormone level testing and like karyotypes um because everything like looks normal Mm -hmm. quote unquote um like on the outside and so like there are people that will go like decades without their life without Mm -hmm. like knowing and then like for them it's probably also like drinking from like the waterfall Mm -hmm. that's Um, true and like my exposure with like the intersex is like uh the community is that like i've like kind of like forced like my way into it Mm -hmm. um i uh i moderate a subreddit called like ask underscore intersex okay um and like there's reddit i really love reddit there's like a lot of like intersex kind of like (laughs) I don't know, like communities, like sub communities there. And um, so it's important for me that like, because like I grew up with like the privilege of like knowing like from like such an early age um, about like who I am and like how I like fall under like this large umbrella Mm -hmm. um, for me to like, yeah, kind of like use like this privilege to like kind of like help guide like other people. Um, And like the most common questions that like I'll get is like people like questioning themselves. They're like, hey, like, I'm showing like these traits. Could I be intersex? And mm-hmm. it's like, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> it's tough though. Yeah, it is. Okay, so like when I use the term gonads, that's like the um, the like reproductive like internal organs that like they either turn into ovaries or like the the testes. Mm-hmm. So I had like testes internally, um, and because of my X Y chromosomes, the the Y was like you're not going to develop like a uterus um, or any like fallopian tubes anything like that if you had to um um continue hormone replace is there something you still manage to this day yes yeah Yeah. um so when i um first was told of like the the condition um i think i was like maybe 12 13 i was like like the ooh entering high school yeah i was like entering high school it was like 13 and um I remember like the doctors like sitting me down. I had a whole team kind of like on house. I had like, there's a straight up, there's a psychologist. There's like the endocrinologist, the hormone person. There's a urologist, a OBGYN, like all sorts of like doctors, like a full team um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, when they, when they sat me down to tell me, that's when they like, they told me like the whole like, you know, everyone starts off at like the same at the baseline. Mm -hmm. Here's like what happened to you. Like your body wasn't receptive. Um, and they're like, in order to simulate puberty, because my body like doesn't understand like the testosterone that like the internal testes were producing, mm-hmm. um, they're like, we're going to like, you know, put you on hormone replacement therapy for like estrogen because like that was like what they put like as my gender marker, like mm-hmm. on my birth certificate. Um, and yeah, so I started taking like a pill like daily and they they kind of instructed me that if I don't take it, I'm basically going to enter like menopause um, at any time that like I stopped taking it. Wow. Okay. Um, and when I, I think it was like when I was like 14, that's when I started taking like the pill and I, you know, went through like puberty, I grew boobs. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember them specifically asking, they're like, <laughs> do you want boobs now or do you want boobs later? <laughs> Isn't that weird? That's interesting. And they asked me in front of my mom. Oh. And, I, and I was like so mortified. 
I wanted boobs I then. You but wanted, no, I you was, didn't want her to know that. Yeah, I was so embarrassed. I was like, why are you asking in front of mom? That like, I was like, I can wait. <laughs> I did not want to wait. Um, but you I, wanted them there. I, I was like, I won't. But you know, like yeah. you're, you're growing yeah. up. There's like all these like little girls like everyone else has them exactly <laughs> yeah and i had like peers that were like oh i got my first period oh. and i'm just like cool i don't know what that's like <laughs> um yeah it's just like really just like really interesting yeah um and so i have to be like on estrogen for the rest of my life they told me until i die mm-hmm. um and if i stop taking it then it's like the the high risks of like menopause mm-hmm. which the main kind of like two things that they said is like osteoporosis mm-hmm. which is like your bones become weaker mm-hmm and then the second one, which sounds less bad, is just like heat flashes. Mm-hmm. Like you'll, your like body can't regulate its own temperature. And when I moved out to LA, like the transition period of like moving across state lines, I like I lost like my insurance like through like my family, and I just like I was like poor trying to like survive in LA, and like I didn't have a um, like a primary care doctor, and like I so for, there was a period of time like. 19 through like maybe like 21 Mm -hmm. that i wasn't on like hormone replacement definitely had the heat flashes yeah Um, Mm -hmm. so i remember like my body was just like i was like "Ah, yeah yeah. i'm hot i'm cold (laughs) why can't i just be comfy Mm -hmm. um and then like sometime when i was like 21 um i got like a, a better job with like better insurance and i was like okay like maybe i should start like looking into this again Mm -hmm. um and then like i had like the journey in la of like going around and like speaking with like doctors and like trying to like advocate for myself to like find somebody who like basically prescribed me like the the hormones Mm -hmm. and um what's really interesting in like my experiences with like the medical system is like most people don't know anything about like partial androgen and mm-hmm. sensitivity syndrome i have to explain it to like a lot of nurses and even doctors themselves wow. mm-hmm. um like and it's always like funny because like they're like oh when's like the date of like your last period and it's like i don't have periods because like i don't have a uterus mm-hmm. and like this is my condition and then like there's always like a pause they're like huh yeah yeah and when- then i'm like sorry like that's just the way that i am um yeah, and so I um I thankfully found like a really good OBGYN at like the Cedar Sinai like medical facility hospital, mm-hmm. um and I loved that doctor. She was so sick. She was like she's like yeah I don't really know much about it, but she's like I'll do research, and she did research. Oh, wow. That's I love that's, yeah, a, that's, that's a doctor that's that a, knows no, or loves their job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like she told me that she was like reaching out to her mentor like in Seattle, and like she was like you know like reading like her i don't know like medical like newsletters or whatever like she was like doing research into my specific condition to Mm -hmm. like find ways to like best treat me and um she's the one that like prescribed me like the the estrogen like replacement like therapy here in like la Mm -hmm. um and then like ever since then like yeah i just have a a daily pill that i'm like supposed to take um and if i stop taking it for like any prolonged period of time then like supposedly my body will start to like high risk of like the osteoporosis mm-hmm. and like the the heat flashes will return mm, okay that's, that's amazing that she did that I, and it's an it's unfortunate that that's rare yeah. that a doctor will go <laughs> like go that in depth and be like oh yeah let me let me i don't know this so let me figure it out yeah mm-hmm. and it just goes to show that um like talking about this makes me think about um like kind of like the climate climate of um everything that's going on in this country when it comes to like anti-trans agenda with like hormones and health care that they're trying to provide to people and it's like where do they draw that line you know all the people that are against providing this health care to our trans community yeah. like like how do we <laughs> like how do they find like there, there are intersex people that do need this or else yeah. it will literally affect your health like it definitely affects your health they find the line yeah yeah (laughs) there's okay what's really spooky um is if you like if you look up like all the recent like anti-trans legislation Mm -hmm. and you look up like how does it affect intersex people almost every single one of those laws has clauses for intersex people where they're like um yeah if someone is born ambiguous or like intersex um we're going to force them to conform to either gender wow and so there's like this whole movement in the intersex community of like um people who are intersex a a lot of them with like 
more severe conditions of where like maybe like John Taylor is like more ambiguous or whatnot, um, they're forced, you know, kind of like unwillingly because they can't consent because they're children Mm -hmm. uh, through surgeries in order to like normalize like what their body looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, And like all of this like anti-trans legislation supports that stuff of where they're like, yeah, like, you know, if the if the gender marker is like male, then like we're going to physically like alter this child's body um, and it doesn't matter. And then they still have the anti-trans legislation of like if a child decides that they don't want like <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> and so that's like sickening. Like, yeah, it's really it's like we're going to force you to conform to whichever gender with surgical yeah. by surgical means. But if you choose that you would like to uh, have a gender reassignment or have more in line with what you feel that's not allowed like it makes no sense insanity yeah. insanity yeah. Uh, really i saw bad. this thing too friend uh when we were uh to bring that up so i was watching um i was watching something else about this and um they were talking about how like if you want if you're like um uh, alternative person and you want like tattoos you want to tattoo your whole body like you know I don't know to look like a cat whatever you want <laughs> like if you want like implants you want all that you want to fork your tongue you want to like Ooh. dye your eyeballs you want to tattoo your eyeball whatever you want to do no one bats an eye but if you just want to feel more comfortable in your skin mm-hmm. nope not allowed to do that, that makes no sense. and like no you can like amputate your own legs if you want if that makes you feel more comfortable and doctors don't like bat an eye they're just like yeah okay let's do that but like no you want to like just feel more comfortable and align with who you are you want to feel like not you're, okay you're like yourself yeah not okay it's it makes no sense insanity <laughs> and i i did actually have a surgery which is um okay so because i had like the undescended testes and like they were producing testosterone mm-hmm. um the the doctors were very like pro like surgery to like remove those um I was like a dumb kid. No one told me anything. And how they phrased it to me when I was like growing up is that they're like, you have these cancer cells in your body <gasps> wow. and we need to remove them or else like you'll get cancer. So wow. I thought I had cancer as a kid. Oh my gosh. That's so, so traumatizing. Yeah. So before I was inter like before I knew I was like intersex, um, like basically how like every medical professional explained to me when I would like go to like these doctors um, is that like, we're just like exploring and like examining your body because it's like something's wrong with it and you're going to have to have like a surgery. So Mm -hmm. like they prepped me to have like a surgery. Um, And like, that's, that's maybe like the thing that like I'm most disappointed by is just like, that seems a little far fetched. Yeah. Um, And like, I'm sure that like my parents like didn't know any better because like it's still tough. Like there's not like a lot of like, um, medical kind of like science and like history about like these conditions and so like they are doing like the best that they can but like Mm -hmm. it's not always like maybe with like the best interest of like the child like in mind absolutely um and another like really kind of like gross thing with like my medical experiences as like a kid is that like it like always made me feel like very i don't know like ashamed and like vulnerable because like every time i would go to a doctor I was like asked to like disrobe oh. and then they would like physically examine me like almost every single time I went to see a professional which was mm-hmm. a lot yeah um and yeah I just like as a child it was just like really like uncomfortable but like my parents are the ones that are taking me to these doctors mm-hmm. and they're like you know like do what the doctor says and like the doctor's like I'm like literally going to like probe you and like yeah. poke around and it's just like that's so mm. uncomfortable and alien and the whole time no one's telling me that like what's going on yeah yeah they're like you know like we've noticed there's something abnormal about your body cool Mm -hmm. um and then they're like eventually um as i got closer to like surgery date they're like yeah so there's these cancer cells in your body and we have to take them out and supposedly there is like some science to it where if like if like um testes like don't descend then like supposedly if they're inside your body they can grow cancer cells Mm -hmm. however like there are people who have like willingly decided to like not mm-hmm. like they've been given the choice um and like i wasn't like really given a choice as like a kid mm-hmm. i'm sure you know like if i knew what was happening I, I probably could have like put up a fuss and just been like no and like refused mm-hmm. um but i didn't know any better yeah and so when i was what was it i think like i was like it was right before fifth grade oh i was like seven or eight mm-hmm. years old um 
right before fifth grade, uh, we did like another like family trip to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which these were family trips, by the way, my entire family with the carpool (laughs) to like Ann Arbor, Michigan, just so that like little Sam could go to like a hospital and like my parents would have like a hotel room and like siblings would be like chilling in like the pool and stuff (laughs) and I would be going to the doctor um and yeah on like um when I was like seven eight uh something like that uh the the doctor the main one overseeing like my case um he explained to me like yeah so we're going to like take you into surgery um on this date in order to like remove like these like cancer cells from your body and so um that's basically what happens um of where like they put me under like anesthesia and then they like they removed like my undescended testes so now i have like nothing i'm like a a blank slate like inside Mm -hmm. like no 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 internal reproductive kind of like Mm -hmm. organs um and yeah like that was just like uh super interesting Mm -hmm. um and it wasn't until like the next trip like maybe like the next summer or something that like i went back to michigan where then they told me like hey actually like it wasn't quite cancer um wow your intersex like here's your specific condition here's like everything about it um yeah how did you feel in that moment like when they told you that my very first question um am i a boy And I looked at my mom. I was like, am I a boy? And she laughed and said, no. I was like, I don't know what to do with this information. (laughs) Yeah. I'm I'm sure it was hard to process at that time. Like, I can't imagine being that age and like, yeah, that's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, It was just like very surreal. Um, Yeah. Like, I mean, it made sense to like why like I had to like keep going to like the doctor. Like, I was like, okay, like, cool. There's like an explanation there. Um, But in terms of like, what that actually meant for me like I didn't like understand like the greater scope of things and like my team of doctors were great like they had um like very like in-depth like you know explain to me like I'm five explanations Mm -hmm. of like here's all like the differences um if I had questions about like oh can I see like my karyotype like they showed me so like they were like good at like you know helping to like educate me um but because there's not like you know like a long history of like effectively like helping people like me yeah. um there's only so much like education i guess that like you can offer yeah. so um it was like a bit of a shell shock but <laughs> my mom did subtly like prep me that like i was different like my entire life mm-hmm. a fun weird fact is that from a really early age she's like you're never going to be able to have natural kids yourself um she's just like you're not going to be able to have kids. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's part of like how they explained like why I was going to see the doctors, mm-hmm. that and the cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like, you know, you can be like Angelina Jolie. You can adopt a bunch of uh, multiracial babies when you're older. <laughs> and so she prepped me instead of like, oh, you're going to give me grandkids. She's like, you're going to adopt like a little black baby, a little Asian baby, mm-hmm. and they're going to be my grandkids. <laughs> it's like, that's kind of cute. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely like a little weird of like, yeah, that's basically like how she was like subtly like prepping me mm-hmm. of like, you know, she was like almost like giving me like breadcrumbs, like clues that like, Mm -hmm. i'm different like here's some of the ways that i'm different and like why yeah i think that's the thing i i appreciate of that your mom did because Mm -hmm. uh, i think especially early early on i think it's always so important to uh, have that like open dialogue with your children and like um prepare them and like i i have found that i have had friends like that you know got their period and didn't know what it was Mm -hmm. because their parents didn't like talk to them about it (laughs) and thankfully my mom did and i i appreciate that all the time that like i was like five years old and she told me what it was and that was going to happen to me and to not worry about it like those open dialogues and conversations i think are so important um when it comes to parents because it it makes you trust them more Mm -hmm. um and yeah i think when you keep stuff like that it's like you begin to question them and you're just I don't know. And I think it removes that, like, I'm 15 and I'm not, my body's not doing what my peers are doing. Now what's wrong? It removes that, like, older shock of, like, whoa. Yeah. It, it pre- like you were saying, it prepped you from the beginning, which I think is really good, too. So it's. Yeah. Do you feel that way? Are you happy that she did? Um, She was doing the best that she could mm-hmm. yeah. with, like, the, the resources she had available. So, like, I'm proud of her for, like, what she did do mm-hmm. yeah um 
was the room for improvement yeah, yeah. 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 Of, course. of course always, <laughs> always. <laughs> um but you know like um if i like try to play place myself in her shoes i'm like yeah like it makes sense like mm-hmm. so yeah mm-hmm. i think she like she she did okay yeah yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you so, so much for sharing that yeah um if there was something you could tell a younger version of yourself what would you tell them um you can tell no mm-hmm. like you can say no um to anybody for mm-hmm. anything um something that i wish i was like taught is that like I didn't have to like consent to like being physically examined. Mm -hmm. Like that was like my biggest, like, I don't know, like personal gripe or like, um, like source of like distress Mm -hmm. is like, it just felt so gross and like uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and like my parents never like talked to me about like sex or like anything to like really do with like, yeah, like sexual reproduction or like safe sex, like nothing like that. Um, and, yeah it just felt like they were like handing me to like the wolves and like the mm-hmm. wolves are like touching my body um I mean, you're an experiment at that point yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, i felt like a lab rat at yeah. times um and so i didn't learn that i could like literally say no mm-hmm. to like these examinations because they're unnecessary like mm-hmm. they're not getting like any new information they're not like running blood work literally nothing like mm-hmm. it's like just poke it's so weird mm-hmm. um yeah like i would have loved to like fought back and like said like no more Mm -hmm. um and it wasn't until like honestly like i started coming to like la that like um when i was like looking into like continuing like my care for like the my condition here that like um when i was like asked i was like no Mm -hmm. no like it's unnecessary um and like unless i have like a valid like reason as to like what it's going to do to like benefit my health mm-hmm. and like i don't have to absolutely i love that yeah. boundaries definitely boundaries. boundaries boundaries is there anything else you want to talk about okay so at this point in my life i'm like i i don't like announce that like i'm intersex like publicly in the sense that like i just like live like this and like for me it's like um it's not like a big part of like my identity in the sense that like clearly like it's who i am and like i grew up like this and it's it's definitely like cultivated like my experiences up to this point um but like i don't like go around just like kind of like talking about it you know Mm -hmm. like um unless like for good reason so Mm -hmm. i have like this little tattoo like xy Mm -hmm. this was my first tattoo so like this is like my chromosomes um and then on i think every social media that i have like i i like hashtag intersex or like born intersex um and so i've like i've put like myself in this position of like i don't like go out of my way to just be like hey did you know that i was intersex <laughs> no um but like i, I kind of like leave breadcrumbs and mm-hmm. then like it's like an open door that like if people like want to like ask me about it like generally um i'm like fairly like comfy and like okay with like sharing about mm-hmm. like maybe like specifics um about like myself and um i was not like this uh Mm -hmm. in high school and like earlier like Mm -hmm. all of like my my first experiences of like coming to terms with it was like kind of like a very like isolating like lonely thing of where it was like me and like my mom Mm -hmm. it was also kind of like a family secret Mm -hmm. in the sense that like my siblings didn't know why i was going to the hospital Mm -hmm. um and like my father was also like pretty distant from like all of this in terms of like like talking to me about like my body and like the ways that I was different um and so it really felt like it was like really just like me and my mom Mm -hmm. like kind of like figuring this out and she was like being the most like supportive and like helpful and then um I had like that one friend who was like online that like I confided in he was probably like I think like the very first person outside of my family um and I'm very thankful for him uh, for his like warm reception because like I think that was like like the key that I needed to like like really accept myself of whereas like oh like if my like best friend who like I love and like he loves me so much is able to just like accept you Mm -hmm. like just be so like accepting of it then like maybe I can like be more accepting of it too Mm -hmm. um because there was like a time that like I had I wouldn't call like a a gender like dysphoria but like um like almost like angry feelings of like you know why was i born this way like why do i have to be different Mm -hmm. um kind of like woe is me like that that kind of whole thing um and like for like my first like formative years uh like after i found out like yeah i didn't tell any of like my in-person kind of like friend group like in my high school um and then 
that slowly started changing of like after I had like that w- very warm reception from like that one friend um I kind of started like picking and choosing like almost like individual people I was like oh this is someone I'm close to and like I love and care for them I think they love and care for me back so maybe I'll like test the waters almost mm. and I'll, so like that was kind of like my kind of coming out moments of like instead of like hey like I like girls or like I'm <laughs> queer or something Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's just like um my variation of coming out was like basically uh, like taking back like the narratives that like people may have had Mm -hmm. and yeah it was really interesting like there was definitely some like weird receptions of like um when i moved out into like my first apartment i moved in with like a a friend from high school like this this girl named brie and we were like we're like pretty tight um, I think she secretly had a crush on me. <laughs> Another friend actually confirmed that. She's like, yeah, I think she had a crush on you. <laughs> Explains so much of her behavior. Um, and um, what's what's funny is that like, um, I, I didn't feel like close enough with her to like test the waters, but like I was very loud and I was like talking to like some online friends and I would like, she, she would like overhear some of the things that I said. Mm. And I remember like once she like, I don't know, like came at me where she was like oh like why do you like tell like these people like personal things but like you don't tell me personal things like that was like a big kind of like point of contention mm-hmm. for her where she was like upset mm-hmm. um and i just remember being like i was really savage back then i was like <laughs> i just don't feel that close to you like i don't consider you a best friend i just consider you a friend <laughs> <laughs> doom yeah not the right thing to say um took me a while to get there (laughs) and she was part of like my larger friend group in high school and that kind of falling out actually like sent like a ripple effect Uh, she basically started talking about like these things that she overheard about me with like the larger like friend group Mm. that we had and they all ditched me oh wow like they all just like and to be fair like we were like entering college and like you know some of us were like moving out into like apartments so like it's a very like not a lot of people stay in touch with like their high school friends yeah. mm-hmm. but like i straight up never talked to them wow. again um and like she would like stayed in touch and i only heard about like these things that she was saying um honestly like two years ago when i reconnected with like a friend who like just happened to be in la and um like i heard through him that like like the stuff that she was saying to me um and then also like maybe two years ago um another friend from like that group actually did reach out to me on Twitter of all places <laughs> and was like, Hey, like, um, yeah. Like I just wanted to like apologize like for like the way that like you were like iced out of like mm. blah, blah, blah. And so like, that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, but I was, I was like entering like a stage of like my life of where like I was taking things like less personally of like, it's really like not about me. I was like, you know, I'll just like push it off like onto them. Like this is like a, a them problem. And then, I felt like very brave when I got like my tattoo of like the XY because I was like, this is like an open invitation of like, everyone's going to be like, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that like put me into like positions of where like I would have like coworkers ask me um, and something. And like, depending on the circumstances, like I would like share, I'd be like, oh yeah, like these are my chromosomes. Like this is like a very short synopsis. Mm -hmm. And and then like basically I just like progressively got like, more brave of where i was like i'm just gonna put like born intersex in like all of my profiles it's like not something like i'm hiding from um but i'm not like loudly announcing it to the world um yeah, yeah so i love that yeah <laughs> well thank you for for sharing your story we're really grateful that you came on and shared it thank you so much thank yeah you so it was much. a pleasure thank you thank you <laughs> all right is there anything you want to plug do you do oh, yeah do, yeah yeah plug it up um <laughs> so less of a plug about me um sure. but i have okay so the first one is a book called born both by hida veloria Love. um and it's someone who has a very similar condition to me um i think she might have a like, complete androgen insensitivity syndrome um it's basically a bio like an autobiography that she wrote about like her experiences of being intersex and her story is fascinating because she didn't find out until much later wow um, oh, okay in her life like when she was like i think past her 20s wow um so i think that's a fantastic read i think that's like really interesting it also talks about her experiences with like the medical system and then like trying to become an advocate for intersex bodies um another one is like 
my first TV show that I saw intersex representation in. Mm -hmm. It's an MTV show called Faking It. Um, that was released in 2014. That. You do? Yes. Yeah. I don't remember if I remember the, the episode, but I remember that I watched a lot of MTV. <laughs> um, but yes, I do remember it that too. It was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the main like premise of the show is like, um, is like these two girls that like they're best friends, but like they pretend to be in like a, a lesbian relationship with each other because their school is like woke basically <laughs> of where like everyone's like queer, or, like gay or like um, there's a lot of like kind of like um, representation that like you wouldn't see normally. Mm -hmm. And they had an intersex character um, as like one of like the the leads and they, they had like a little story arc and like mm -hmm. that was like my first ever representation. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. Um, I will check that That's out. That's great. Yeah. And the book. The book sounds really cool. Yeah. And then my final one is um, the ask underscore intersex subreddit on Reddit. Um, people can find me there if they want to like ask questions to like the, the grand community. Um, so, yeah. I will be following. I love Reddit. You do love Reddit. <laughs> I do love Reddit. I, <laughs> I don't know how to work Reddit, but I, have I to teach you. This is this year. I told myself I was going to get into Reddit. It's fascinating. I love hearing other people <laughs> talk in their 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 um opinions on things yeah yeah, yeah. love yeah. that love it okay Fun. yeah i guess we'll do socials yeah please follow us on instagram it's one thing queer and my personal instagram is specs ray x and my personal instagram is at jenny lynn bouton and if you want to uh, follow us on tiktok we also have a tiktok at one thing queer podcast also if you want to come on the podcast and share your story please email us at one thing queer at gmail.com yeah Reach out, like, share. Yes. Um, tell your friends. Share this episode if you feel like it's gonna. If somebody needs it, somebody needs to hear. Um, and also make sure you rate and uh, follow our podcast. Yeah, it really helps us out. All right, I guess that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode of One Thing Queer. We'll talk to y'all next week. Thank you so much for coming. Sam. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, Sam. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Music by Jacody Lamone. Produced by Kelsey Wren and Jenny Baton. Edited by Jenny Baton.